Good evening and welcome to the third in our series of lectures to mark and celebrate the 50th anniversary of the law school by hearing from distinguished friends of the school, including uh, alumni and former colleagues. Tonight's lecture with Sir Maurice Kay promises to provide a real insight into the developing role of the judiciary from the actual experience of one of its most uh, eminent members. So, a few words by way of introduction, and I've um, reduced this significantly, otherwise there wouldn't be any time for you to talk. <laughs> um, Sir Morris was called to the bar in 1975, following a period in academia. He held lectureships at Manchester and Hull University, and was Professor of Law here at Keele from 1973 until 1982. He holds a PhD from Sheffield and an honorary doctorate from Keele. Uh, during his career at the bar, he uh, covered a wide-ranging uh, practice, including sitting as an arbitrator overseas, and was appointed as a High Court judge in 1995. He also was a judge of the Employment Appeal Tribunal and the judge in charge of the Administrative Court. In 2004, he was appointed a Lord Justice of Appeal and Vice President of the Court of Appeal Civil Division for five years. During his time in the Court of Appeal, Sir Morris has sat on some of the most significant appeals in the country, and I'm sure we're going to hear about some of those um, this evening. Uh, Sir Morris continues to sit part-time in the Court of Appeal and, based at King's Chambers, accepts appointments as an arbitrator for both domestic and international arbitrations. So it's my great pleasure to invite Sir Morris to deliver his lecture on the topic of judicialising government and politicising the judiciary. Sir Morris. Alison, thank you very much for that um, introduction. Um, uh, factually, it was mainly correct. Um, <laughs> but I, I ought to own up to one thing. Whilst I did, following my retirement four years ago, carry on in the Court of Appeal on a part-time basis, uh, I can no longer do that because two months ago I reached what judges call the age of statutory senility, um, after which you're not allowed to sit in the Court of Appeal or anywhere else in this country. So I look for pastures elsewhere. It's a great pleasure to be back uh, in this university which was, as Alison has said, my academic home and place of work for almost 10 years in the 1970s and early 1980s. I was very fortunate. The then head of the law department, Professor Don Thompson, and the then vice chancellor, Professor Campbell Stewart, agreed to let me qualify and practice at the bar whilst remaining in post here. That was quite unusual in law schools at the time, Almost inevitably, a point came where I had to choose between my two jobs. That I chose the bar was not entirely unrelated to the fact that in the 1980s, and particularly the early 1980s, universities in general, and Keele in particular, were having a rather difficult time. It gives me great satisfaction to return 35 years later, knowing those precarious times gave way to years of great achievement for Keele, uh, and in particular to its law school. And I'm delighted to be able to extend sincere congratulations to all those who have contributed to its growth and current reputation. In my academic years, uh, my main interests were in company law, competition law, and employment law, including the European implications. However, my practice at the bar was far more varied than that. And as a judge in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, uh, 
I eventually came to specialise in public law, judicial review and human rights. That immediately identifies me as a creature of my judicial time. Very few judges from earlier times had the opportunity to major in these fields. When I started at the bar, judicial review ex rarely extended beyond a single court in the Royal Courts of Justice, and that for less than a full working week at a time. However, by the time I came to sit in what was still then called the Crown Office List in the 1990s, its growth was well underway. Initially, I was one of about 18 High Court judges who spent an average of about a third of their time doing the work in what was soon to become the Administrative Court. In the early noughties, when I spent two years as the judge in charge of the Administrative Court, its caseload had grown to about 6,000 cases per year. The growth since then has remained exponential. Now there must be about 100 judges involved in the Administrative Court, uh, not just in London, but in an evolved basis around the country uh, for part of their working year. There are many reasons for this growth, including the increased range and complexity of immigration and asylum law, the Human Rights Act 1998, the expansion of other statutory frameworks for the exercise of executive power, and a growing awareness in the legal profession and the public at large that the rule of law imposes legal constraints on the way in which government and public bodies make decisions which impact upon individuals, or as you're now supposed to say, impact individuals. In this lecture, I shall try to explain how and why judges have become more involved in determining the lawfulness of executive decisions. That is what I have tendentiously referred to as judicialising government. Having said my piece on that, I want to consider the other side of the coin and ask whether along the way the judiciary has become unduly politicised and whether the, these developments of the judicial process have or should have implications for the way in which judges are selected and promoted. Let me begin by taking you back to the culture of judicial review at the time when I became a judge in 1995. As every law student knows, the classical centerpiece of our administrative law uh, until very recent times was expounded by Lord Green in the case of um, Associated Provincial Picture House and Wensbury Corporation uh, just after the Second World War. It emphasised the limited role of the courts. It was not for a judge to decide what an ex executive decision should be. In the context of a licensing decision, which is what that case was concerned with, made by a local authority, he said, the court is entitled to investigate the action of the local authority with a view to seeing whether they've taken into account matters which they ought not to have taken into account, or conversely, have refused to take into account or neglected to take into account matters which they ought to take into account. Once that question is answered in favour of the local authority, it may still be possible to say that although the local authority have kept within the four corners of the matters which they ought to consider, they have nevertheless come to a conclusion so unreasonable that no reasonable local authority could ever come to it. So, apart from that third category, sometimes referred to as irrationality or perversity, and which was approached with a considerable amount of judicial reserve, the court limited itself to matters of process rather than substance or merits. Moreover, the courts continued to acknowledge areas of public decision-making which they considered unsuitable for judicial consideration in any event. 
In the GCHQ case in the House of Lords in 1985, the House of Lords was concerned to redefine the scope of judicial review in the face of criticism of increased judicial activism. Lord Diplock categorised the grounds for judicial review as illegality, ir irrationality and procedural impropriety. And Lord Roskill and others acknowledged that there were, in any event, judicial no-go areas. He said, for example, prerogative powers such as those relating to the making of treaties, the defence of the realm, the prerogative of mercy, the grant of honours, the dissolution of Parliament and the appointment of ministers, as well as others, are not susceptible to judicial review because their nature and subject matter are such as not to be amenable to the judicial process. Thus recognising that there were certain areas into which judges simply would not venture. Although the law of judicial review continued to develop, and exceptions continued to be narrowed, the law as set out in the GCHQ case was essentially the law which I began to apply when first entrusted with the task of judicial review. Without being too autobiographical, I was one of a three-judge court in Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament against the Prime Minister in 2002 a case in which uh, CND applied to the High Court for a declaration that the UK government would be acting in breach of international law were it to take military action against Iraq without a further resolution of the UN Security Council. The case was argued and decided about four months before the Iraq war. Uh, Lord Justice Simon Brown, who was the senior presiding judge of the three of us, uh, re refer to the application as a novel and ambitious claim. All three of us rejected it for a variety of reasons. In my judgment, I base my decision on my assessment that CND was essentially inviting us into one of the GCHQ forbidden areas. Basing myself on that case, I said foreign policy and the deployment of armed forces remain non-justiciable. That turned out to be the high watermark of my restraint. I therefore want to consider how it came about that in the ensuing years my colleagues and I found ourselves adjudicating upon government decisions of a kind and in ways that few of us could ever have anticipated. There can be no doubt that the principal, but not the only, driver was the Human Rights Act, which made most of the rights set out on, in the European Convention on Human Rights enforceable in our domestic courts. Of course, many convention rights do no more than reflect pre-existing domestic common law rights, and it is also a truism that the common law was showing signs of an increased recognition of fundamental rights even before the coming into force of the Human Rights Act. However, the consequences of the Act were inherently expansive of the judicial role. First, although the architecture of the Act preserves the sovereignty of Parliament as the centrepiece of our unwritten constitution, it empowered the courts to make declarations of incompatibility of primary legislation with the European Convention and provided a fast-track parliamentary procedure to render the domestic legislation compliant. Secondly, it created substantive rights which were not so established previously in domestic law. For example, the absolute right not to be subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment in Article 3, and the qualified right to respect for a private and family life in Article 8. Thirdly, in determining the scope of some convention rights, it has expressly brought the European concept of proportionality into domestic law. <coughs> 
turning to those three items, uh, I do not want to spend too much time on declarations of incompatibility. So far, there have been, I think, about 29 of them. I was party to two or three of them. But perhaps the best known, not one of my cases, were the declarations in A against the Secretary of State, which caused the government to repeal its legislation, which had permitted the detention without trial of foreign suspected terrorists. And also the Anderson case in 2002, which led to the government ending the power of the Home Secretary to fix the minimum term of imprisonment to be served by a prisoner serving a mandatory life sentence prior to an application for parole. However, it seems to me that what has been most significant has not been the number of cases but the statutory enlargement of the judicial function. A judge who has been entrusted with the power to influence the content, the content of primary legislation, albeit indirectly, may begin to feel less inhibited when uh, dealing uh, with other judicial review cases. Turning to the second category, substantive human rights. It is instructive to refer to one of the early Human Rights Act cases, uh, Limbuela and others, which got to the House of Lords in, I think, 2005. At the time, there was concern about the increase in the number of asylum seekers and the cost of the state of supporting them pending determination of their claims. It had become apparent that many were not claiming asylum on arrival, but were only doing so some time later, often when the date and circumstances of their arrival were difficult to ascertain. Many were thought not to be genuine asylum seekers, just economic migrants who had entered the country illegally and claimed asylum days, weeks, months, or sometimes years later. Although legislation required the government to provide financial support for asylum seekers pending determination of their claims, by Section 55 of the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act 2002, the Secretary of State was empowered to withhold asylum support where he was not satisfied that the application for asylum had been made as soon as reasonably practicable after arrival in the country. There was a sort of underlying assumption that people who didn't apply straight away were less likely to be genuine asylum seekers, whether that was correct or not. However, support could only be withheld if the withholding would not involve a breach of the applicant's human rights. In the Limbuela case and a number of other cases, almost every judge who had to consider the issue in the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords concluded that to leave an asylum seeker destitute pending determination of his claim amounted to inhuman or degrading treatment pursuant to Article 3. In order to reach that decision, the courts had to interpret the words treatment and inhuman or degrading. But my point is that they had been given new powers involving concepts that were novel in domestic law and they were being required to adjudicate upon the merits of the application of what at the time was a high profile and controversial government policy. The third category of human rights involvement is perhaps the most interesting, proportionality. Although it had long been an important concept in the administrative law of other European countries and was well established in European Union law, it had not as such penetrated our domestic Wensbury approach. When the Human Rights Act came into force in 2000, 
it was obvious that judges were going to have to consider the proportionality of challenged executive acts and decisions, particularly in the context of the qualified rights, which were defined by reference to a balance between the right of the individual and the interests of the state. Uh, this was acknowledged and explained by Lord Steyn in the case of Daly in 2001, when he pointed out that the proportionality test requires more than traditional, the traditional Wensbury approach, or even the so-called super Wensbury approach, which had crept into more recent domestic cases involving fundamental rights. Nevertheless, said Lord Steyn, talking of proportionality, this does not mean that there has been a shift to merits review. In other words, he was saying there's been a change, but it's modest, and proportionality does not add that much to our existing uh, concepts. In other words, the primary decision-making power remained vested in the authorised executive decision-maker, for example, in immigration cases and asylum cases, the Home Secretary and his officers, and the role of the courts remained one of the review of that decision, not a primary decision-making role. However, what has become apparent since then is that in some areas, the courts do have to make their own assessment of what is or is not proportionate. Again, immigration law provided the battleground. In the early Human Rights Act challenges to immigration decisions on Article 8 grounds, the courts tended to adopt a restrained Wensbury type approach considering whether the executive decision was one which the decision maker was reasonably entitled to consider proportionate. Whether or not the court itself would have come to the same conclusion. Uh, see, for example, the case of M. Croatia in 2004. However, in Huang in 2007, the House of Lords made it clear that the legislation establishing the jurisdiction of the immigration tribunals and beyond them the courts conferred a primary decision-making power. The tribunals and on appeal the courts were not confined to a reviewing role. They had to form their own view on the merits of whether the executive decision was proportionate or not. This is a clear example of legislation having expressly enlarged the role of the judges, not of the judges simply arrogating powers to themselves. Another area in which the same can be said is the balance between the right to respect for private life in Article 8 and freedom of expression in Article 10. I want to gradually move away from the Human Rights Act now the observation I want to make is that at about the same time as these express statutory enlargements of the role of the judiciary, other legislation was following a similar pattern. So when the Labour government sought to replace its legislation on the detention without trial of foreign terrorism suspects with the concept of control orders following the uh, defeat in the A case, it did so by creating a new statutory role for the courts, necessarily bringing in cross-references to the Human Rights Act. Article 5 protects individuals against the unlawful deprivation of liberty. Control orders plainly limited the freedom of those who were subject to them. The courts had to decide where the boundary lay between the deprivation of liberty, which is unlawful, and the mere restriction of liberty, which can be lawful. 
a matter of fact and degree, as to which judges had to, quote, have regard to the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Control orders were interesting because they involved the interplay of new statutory concepts, an express role for the judges in adjudicating upon them, and cross-references to the Human Rights Act in that task. Some modern legislation, however, has required judicial consideration of immensely important political and economic issues. Consider, for example, the rather mundane sounding Air Quality Standards Regulations 2010, domestic law giving effect to an EU directive. The regulations require the government to publish air quality plans aimed at reducing exposure to nitrogen dioxide emissions. By Regulation 26, the government's air quality plan must include measures intended to secure compliance with any relevant limit value within the shortest possible time. In a series of cases, the pressure group Client Earth has established repeated breaches of those duties. My point is that, until recently, any legislation on such matters would almost certainly have been limited to uh, expressions of aspiration or targets and not couched in terms of justiciable obligations. Nor is it only in EU-derived law that we see this phenomenon. The Warm Homes and Energy Conservation Act 2000 enacted statutory obligations which required the government to take specific steps to ensure that so far as reasonably practicable, persons do not live in fuel poverty, as was there defined. In a case brought by a number of pressure groups, led by Friends of the Earth, uh, I had to give a judgment on issues involving statutory interpretation, practicability, and departmental budgets. In the event, the challenge failed, but the judgment nevertheless demonstrates how deeply judges are, no, are now drawn into disputes which until recently would have been considered non-justiciable matters of policy and would not have been expressed in legislation which required uh, judicial consideration. It is the way in which recent statutes have been framed that has brought about this change. Some of these cases have massive political and economic implications. In 2012, I was a member of the Court of Appeal which had to consider the lawfulness of the government's decision to change the measure for inflation-proofing state pensions and welfare benefits from the retail price index to the consumer price index. The decision was aimed at saving £6 billion per year. The statutory duty required the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to determine that pensions and, bene that pensions and benefits have retained their value in relation to the general level of prices estimated in such manner as the Secretary of State thinks fit. As that language suggests, a Wensbury challenge faced the difficulty that the consumer price index had a volume of rational justification. However, certain other issues had to be considered, including whether, and if so, and to what extent, the Secretary of State could consider the implications for the national economy when choosing his index. The judgment of New Lord Newberger, with which I agreed, concluded 
that the answer was yes, although, quote, it can only play a relatively attenuated role in limited circumstances. Paragraph 49 of the judgment shows that that was a close-run thing in that case. Again, my point is that the courts were not just invited, but forced onto this territory by the complexity of the legislation, which expressly circumscribed the power of the minister. I could go on, you may think probably that I am doing, um, but it's hardly surprising that a generation of judges which had been brought up to understand the limits of judicial review only to discover that modern legislation was narrowing those limits may have begun to lose some of its inhibitions. Uh, I did not expect or desire that when I embarked on these judicial tasks in the 1990s. I did not expect to be called upon to hear serious cases on issues such as the conduct of the Iraq war, the introduction of the congestion charge, the expansion of London's airports, the legality of the Hunting Act, still one of my favourite cases, and the socio-economic quasi-political cases that I've been describing. All this has generated a huge expansion of public law practitioners, whose ranks now include some of the best legal brains in the country. They can conjure an application for judicial review to almost anything. And so I accept that the judicial function has, in one sense, become more politicized. My defense is that from a judicial perspective, this has been demand-led. The leading, having been generated by the legislation enacted by Parliament at the behest of successive governments, and the response of a highly skilled legal profession. I would maintain that the judiciary has kept its collective feet on the ground in responding to these circumstances. On close analysis, few of the landmark cases can be validly and objectively criticised. Politicians may sometimes be frustrated by them, and less responsible elements in the media may self-indulgently condemn enemies of the people, but I do not believe that anyone who values the rule of law can see recent judicial history in that way. If time permitted, I would refer to a large number of high-profile cases in which judges resisted the good call to go further than they have. My conclusion on this first stage of my lecture is that there has been a degree of judicialization of government, but it has been largely self-inflicted by successive governments, and given their legislative predilections, it has been extremely beneficial. That government remains intent on continuing down this road it is perhaps well illustrated by Clause 6.2 of the European Union Withdrawal Bill, which is headed Interpretation of Retained EU Law. This is referring to uh, EU law and EU-derived law, which continues in force as domestic law uh, following Brexit. Uh, some of our, oh, the, the clause 6.2 actually says, uh, a court or tribunal uh, need not have regard to anything done on or after exit day by the European court, another EU entity, or the EU, but may do so if it considers it appropriate to do so. In other words, leaving it to the courts to decide uh, whether and to what extent to apply European court cases as a basis for resolving the same law, but in a different jurisdiction, namely the post-Brexit UK court. Uh, 
Uh, some of our most senior judges, uh, for example, Lord Newberger, have complained about that drafting on the ground that it is too open and lacks guidance, leaving it to the judges to work out for themselves what is and what is not appropriate, and thereby exposing them to potential political criticism of their judgments as being too Europhile or too Eurosceptic. One can see the point, but for myself, I do not think that the judiciary would be unduly compromised. It has taken a little time, but we worked out a way in which we would, quote, take into account decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, pursuant to Section 2 of the Human Rights Act. And I do not see why today's judges should be coy when addressing Clause 6.2, if indeed it makes the statute book in its present form. My conclusion on the question of the judicialization of government is that yes, it has happened, and because our socio-economic and political structures and decision-making processes have become more complex and more far-reaching, it was bound to happen. The rule of law has been extended into more and different areas, some of them controversial. It is my view that the judicial response has almost always been restrained and appropriate. It is not best characterised as judicial activism. It is a simple development of constitutionalism. Let me finish this part of the lecture with an illustration. In the post-9-11 world, it is natural that any government wants to protect and secure its citizens to the maximum extent compatible with human rights. So they go as far as they think they can with legislation, be it detention without trial, control orders, TPIMs, or whatever. I understand that natural political urge and function. The necessary role of the courts is to ensure that they have not gone further than the rule of law permits. And at each and every stage in almost 20 years, the legal boundary has been identified by the courts and respected by successive governments. That is how it should be. I now turn to the other side of the coin. If judges are now making more high-profile decisions with political implications, should their selection and promotion, at least at High Court, Court of Appeal and Supreme Court level, have more political input? I have to confess that my appointment to the High Court in 1995 and my promotion to the Court of Appeal nearly a decade later were pursuant to a process totally lacking in transparency. I came from the tap-on-the-shoulder culture, which prevailed into the early years of the present millennium. I shall not attempt, nor do I wish, to defend it. However, I sometimes think that the public do not know just how radically the culture was changed by the establishment of the Judicial Appointments Commission under the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. The JAC effectively selects all the judges, from the Lord Chief Justice, Master of the Roll, Court of Appeal, down. The Supreme Court being a UK and not just an England and Wales court, has its appointments processed uh, via an almost identical structure, but with additional representation from uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland. The central statutory provision for, the, for all appointments is section 63.2, quote, selection must be solely on merit. Section 63.4 and Section 64 provide for the encouragement of diversity, but subject to the overriding merit criterion. Uh, 
The chair must be a lay person. The present chair is a professor of surgery at UCL. Of the 15 current commissioners, six are judges from various levels of the judiciary and two are legal practitioners. The most senior judge and uh, deputy chair of the commission is Lady Justice Rafferty, who, like me, uh, made her way from a provincial grammar school to the University of Sheffield. The lay members are all people of outstanding achievement. Four of the commissioners are from an ethnic minority background. Six are women. It would be a grotesque calumny to suggest that the JAC is not of very high calibre and fiercely independent. I have never been a commissioner, but for several years I was co-opted to... Uh, selection panels which were uh, appointing uh, High Court judges. My experience of those exercises uh, was that the lay members played a full and robust part in the selection process and that the process was extremely fair and rigorous. Until about three years ago there was always a surplus of appointable candidates. More recently, that has not always been so. The reasons for that are complex and controversial, and I shall not go into them further right now. I simply pass on my experience that the process is transparent, the selection criteria are published and rigorous, and the persons appointed to the High Court bench remain of very high quality. Uh, following her appointment as President of the Supreme Court, uh, Baroness Hale has suggested that at least at Supreme Court level, and also in relation to the Lord Chief Justice and the heads of the three divisions of the High Court, uh, selection panels for appointment... should include two politicians, one from the government side, the other from the opposition. Her argument is that because senior judges make decisions with political consequences and do so by applying concepts such as proportionality, the public should uh, know more about their politics and politicians should have a greater say in their appointment. That, she said, would introduce an element of democratic involvement while preserving political neutrality. Uh, Baroness Hale is an outstanding judge. I have admired her since we were both young lecturers at the University of Manchester in the early 1970s. On this issue, however, I believe that she is wrong. I was going to explain why in my own words, but that might have seemed like special pleading. I cannot improve on what has been said, uh, not by a judge, but by perhaps the most revered barrister of his generation, uh, Lord David Panic, QC. He said this of Baroness Hale's suggestion. The implementation of any such proposal would be wrong in principle and disastrous in practice. Politicians have nothing specific to contribute to a panel that is assessing the candidates against the prescribed criteria. More importantly, the presence of politicians on the panel would pose a danger that the relevant criteria would in practice be supplemented or even worse, replaced by a focus on the perceived political acceptability of the candidates. Indeed, to welcome politicians to an appointment panel would wrongly signal that political factors are relevant to selection. <laughs> 
As Lord Panic went on to observe, courts make decisions according to the law, whether or not the judgments are popular with politicians or with the public. They have no constituency. I always cringe when politicians refer in a pejorative way to unelected judges. It's precisely because they are unelected and unanswerable to politicians that they can maintain their independence and discharge their constitutional function as guardians of the rule of law. Baroness Hale said one thing that resonated with me. She said, I do not know the politics of most of my colleagues. That reflects my experience in the Court of Appeal. Some are more identifiable than others, but most seem to have diverse opinions formed on an issue-by-issue -issue basis rather than ones which reflect party alignment or any ideology. And even when a judge's known personal opinion might lead to an expectation that he would decide a particular case in a particular way, that expectation will often be shown to have been false when his judgment is handed down. Just before the Brexit Article 50 case in the Supreme Court, the omniscient Daily Mail ran a feature in which each of the 11 judges was given a Europhile rating. As you know, the court divided 8-3 in that important case. The individual judgments, however, did not reflect the predictions of the Daily Mail. They are a vivid illustration of judicial independence. Much as I respect the US Supreme Court, I do not think that its decisions in politically charged cases have the same reputation for political neutrality. So often they divide on party lines. That seems to me to be inevitable once a system of judicial appointments becomes politicised. I hope ours never does. Thank you.